Hi, my name is Ben. I'm one of the pastors here at the Tabernacle. Thank you for joining us for another online worship service. We want to say thank you once again for your continued faithfulness to God with your giving. We see giving here at the Tabernacle as an act of worship. Another act of worship is baptism, and through the month of August at both of our campuses, we're going to be baptizing new believers. If you've never been baptized, if you're within driving distance of one of our campuses and you'd like to be baptized, we'd ask you to sign up on our website, thetabchurch.com. We'll connect with you and talk through baptism, make sure you understand it, and then we'll invite you out to join us. And if you're not within driving distance, still get in touch with us. Maybe we can make some special arrangements. But in the meantime, let's worship together.
worship together. Let's sing. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the tabernacle. That was three welcomes. Do you feel welcome? I hope so. Welcome to those who are worshiping with us here in Buckley and to those that are worshiping with us in Manistee or wherever you are. We're glad that you're here. If you're still watching online, we're glad that you're here. But I'm especially glad for those folks who have run the blockades and showed up live. It is good to see human beings again. And uh, uh, we're glad that you've joined us this weekend. I'm a little bit fired up, and so I want to apologize in advance if I freak anybody out. But uh, I got a message burning in my heart. But before I jump into that, um, I'll just tell you a little story, a little something about my life. So my wife Darcy and I, we've been uh, married almost 30 years. 
And I've learned a lot of hard lessons through that time. Most of them are how smart she is and how I'm not. Can I get a witness? You with me? Okay, good. I'm going to need some help with this one now. So um, this is a typical scene. This actually happened again just a couple of weeks ago uh, when we were actually uh, uh, out and about in town. We were in another state, but this has happened more than once. And typically, you know, we hit a store and my wife is a professional, right? So when she hits a store, as many moms are, uh, we, you know, in our home, we have five kids and a son-in-law. So they've got all these people that are opportunities for her to bless through all the knowledge that she has in her head, all the knowledge and the expertise. So she can go through there. She knows everyone's sizes. She knows everyone's tastes, what everyone likes. And I'm killing time, right? And so I meander over to the dude section. Uh, that's men for those of you that don't know what I'm talking about. And I'm going through and I, you know, I'm cheap. So I'm on the clearance rack and I, oh, those are pants are interesting. And I've lost a few LBs and, oh, there's a shirt that might go with that. And that's, da, da, da. and then I'll, I'll, you know, I won't have a cart, but I'll have like five, six, seven, eight things over the course of a long time that I'll grab. Now, are you guys with me at all? Do you remember back when we could shop? Okay. okay. So I know it's a long time ago, right? Some of you can't even remember. So I got a stack of clothes and, uh, you know, typically you'd go to the dressing room. Well, the dressing rooms are shut down, but even if there wasn't a dressing room, there's one stop for me before the dressing room. And that's, I got to find her. So I'm looking around in the women's section or the kids section or wherever she's at, see her beautiful blonde head and go over. And this last time she's there and she's, you know, accumulating and there's some other ladies that we don't know that are around her and this is this was our legitimate conversation I come up to her and I go hey hey babe she's like yeah what and I hold up my stuff and I go I need your help and everyone can hear me and I go do I like these (laughs) and the ladies around that I don't know are like (laughs) you know But that's a legitimate question because I might have an opinion. I might even think, but if she doesn't, if her opinion doesn't bless that, it ain't happening. Because sometimes it's like, no, honey, you've you've lost, those are going to be too big for you. They don't fit right. Or really, that color? How many times do I have to tell you? Or the best one is when she goes, babe, you're 50. (laughs) Right? Come on. And I'm like, sorry. And I just... I'm that guy that sometimes hangs it right there in the ladies' section, right? (laughs) Just move on. But her opinion matters to me. And when you've been married almost 30 years, I need that opinion. And if, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if you're a guy and you don't seek her opinion out, not my wife, but your wife, you're, you're kind of foolish, right? Because you can think whatever you have in your mind, but if mama don't like it, it's not happening, right? Opinions matter. And we live in a culture where we all believe we're entitled to an opinion, right? And so we look for opinions about everything. And you know what they say about opinions is everybody's got one, right? There's some other things they say, but this is church. Calm down. But we believe that, you know, we're entitled to an opinion about everything. And our opinion many times is the most important opinion. Now, I'm wise enough to know that when it comes to my clothing, I need to ask her. But we have opinions about clothes. We have opinions about food. We have opinions about politics. We have opinions about a lot of things. If if we didn't have all these opinions, social media wouldn't exist, right? We have to share those opinions. And, and, And like I said, we believe to a certain degree that everyone is entitled to an opinion. But if we're honest, most of our opinions have to do with preferences, what we prefer, right? So I've said many times that uh, pie is superior to cake. And I've offended people with that because they're like, well, you haven't had my cake and I don't want your cake. I would like pie. That's a preference. That's an opinion. Is it true that pie is superior to cake? I might think so, but that's not necessarily the truth because that's based on individual preferences. Now, stay with me. This is where it gets dangerous. In our culture, we've equated people's preferences with truth. Preferences have become truth. And that's a problem when it comes to matters of faith. 
That's a problem when it comes to matters of what is really true. You see, we live in a culture now, and, and I don't care how old or young you are, you can agree or you can think of examples. I'll give you a couple. We live in a culture that is governed by a philosophy of moral relativism. Basically, what that thinking is, is that, you know, what's true for you is true for you, but that may not be true for me. And everyone's entitled to their opinion. But is that true? Is that really, really true? Well, with preferences, yes. Sometimes we go, well, that's just their perspective. Well, you can have a certain perspective or a certain opinion, but it, when it comes to matters of faith, when it comes to matters of where I'll spend eternity, when it comes to matters of right and wrong or morality, it's very dangerous to base your life on opinion. Now church, stay with me. Here and in Manistee, here's the problem. That philosophy is seeping into the church. It is seeping into Christendom because it's the culture of our day, right? So someone has a political view and they say, this is what I believe. And someone says, well, I, well, I disagree. Well, you know, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. That may be true for Detroit, but it's not true for Northern Michigan. That may be true for, you know, the left coast, but not here in flyover country. That may be true for your people or from your perspective or what happened to you. But there are some truths that never change. Otherwise, what do we base our lives on? Now, there's a classic uh, explanation of this, and this actually comes from Hindu thinking or, or Eastern theology, and it goes like this. It's, it's, I've shared this with some of you before. It's the classic fable of the six blind men and the elephant, right? The six blind men and the elephant. Have you ever seen this before? If you have, just raise your hand real quick. Okay, some of you haven't. Knowledge drop is about to happen. Not a mic drop. That's Pastor Britton, right? This is knowledge drop. And so typically what this is used to do is explain why do we have Christianity and Islam and Hinduism and Buddhism and Mormonism and Jehovah's Witness and atheism and agnosticism and all the other isms in between. And this is what the wise Hindu shaman likes to tell us, is there were six blind men who came across an elephant. Now remember they're blind, just say blind so you don't forget blind. So there's six blind men and the elephant, and they're all touching the elephant. Now, it's an elephant, but this one got a hold of the tusk and said, why, it's a spear. He's holding onto the tusk, makes sense, feels like a spear. This one grabs a hold of the tree trunk, and say, or, 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 or of the trunk, and says, oh, it's a snake. You know, the guy over here grabs a hold of a leg and says, it's a tree. One is on the side, and he goes, no, you're all wrong, it's a wall. You know, one of them holds the ear and says, it's a fan. Someone else grabs the tail and says, it's a rope. And so what the wise moral relativist says is it's all depending on their perspective. Everyone's got a little bit of the truth and they're all kind of right but not completely right. Have you heard this describe world religions before? I have. Well, yeah, this guy's right, but so is that guy. There's a problem with the illustration. There's a problem with the metaphor and it's built right in and it's hypocritical. And if you think about it long enough, it's obvious. You know what the problem is? The guy telling the story is the only one who can see. So essentially he's saying the Christian is wrong, the Hindu is wrong, the Muslim is wrong. All these world religions, they're, they're all just kind of right, but mostly wrong. That's really God is all of those things, and they just understand it in a different way. Are you tracking with me? But the hypocrisy is he's claiming that he can see, and that you're blind, and that I'm blind. Well, this seeps in to Christian thinking as well. How does it seep in? You know, we start saying things like, well, you know, that may be true for you that not everyone will be saved, but you know what? I'd like to believe in a God who's eventually going to save everyone. Whoa, does it say that? Or when we say, you know what? This idea that God had to have his own son sacrificed on a cross, I've got a real problem with that. 
That's, look, that's just my opinion. You can be old-timey Bible thumper. Whoa, we're falling into the same trap here of what is truth and what is opinion or what is truth and what is our preference. This is important, and it's important in 2020. You see, this way of thinking, this moral relativism, it doesn't hold water in the real world. And even if I'm like, what's he talking about this weekend? Stick around long enough and pay attention, either to the news or to anyone having any type of discussion. Eventually you'll say, well, that may be true for you, but that's not true for me. This is the thinking. Um, Have you noticed that that way of thinking doesn't work when you go to the bank? (laughs) You're talking to the teller and you're like, I got $500. And they're like, you have five. Well, that may be true for you, but it's not true for me. Doesn't fly, does it? My favorite story, I, I, I had the privilege to take a class from the late, great Dr. Ravi Zacharias, and he told us this story, and, and uh, it's, it, it happened at the Ohio State University. Couldn't have happened at a better place, right? Come on, Michigan, I don't care if you're state or Wolverine, come on, right? And uh, he's in Columbus, Ohio, and he's speaking at the campus, and he's getting a campus tour. And, and the guy that was, you know, t- telling him all about the Ohio State, it's never just Ohio State, it has to be the Ohio State, right? He's given a campus of, or a tour, a campus tour of the Ohio State University, and he pointed out this brand new building. You can check it out online. It's the Wexner Performing Arts Center. And the Wexner Performing Arts Center, as they went by it, uh, Dr. Zacharias goes, you know, that building, that new arts center, it's actually a monument to postmodern thinking. It's actually a monument to, to the, you know, the, the age that we live in, that what's true for you may not be true for me, you know, this whole moral relativism thing. And Dr. Zacharias said, how so? And he goes, in that building, there's no, uh, like, right angles. And, you know, everything's just kind of thrown together without a plan. Uh, It's very artsy. You would love it. They have pillars that hang from the ceiling but don't touch the floor. They're not supporting anything. It's just a pillar hanging, right? There's stairways that go to nowhere. It's just really, it's a fabulous monument to the, you know, the new age philosophy. And Dr. Zacharias, in only a wise way that he can, riding in that car, said, I only have one question. Did you do the same thing with the foundation?" Dead silence in the car. Sounds neat. What's true for you is true for me, or or may not be true for me. Not really livable on things that matter. So if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to uh, look at three scriptures with me. The first is in the Old Testament in Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 7. Because this whole what's true for you may not be true for me, what does God have to say about that? And that's the kind of church we want to be, a church that says, okay, that's nice that a politician said it, or that Oprah said it, or some talking head said it, or my favorite actress or actor or singer, but what does God say about it, right? Sorry, it's in Jeremiah 17, not 7. Starting in verse 5. It says, thus says the Lord, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart turns away from the Lord. If you skip down to verse seven, it says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. And then down in verse nine, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? And so what God says here in Jeremiah 17 is that for those who trust that truth is in the Lord, there is blessing. But for those who trust in man and in man's opinion, there's curses. And then he tells us why right there in verse 9. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Some translations, I like actually how it says it better. It says, the heart is desperately wicked right? How many times do we say to one another when we're faced with a big issue, well, you know, I'm just going to follow my heart. You know, well, you know, I, you know, it's no big deal about, you know, you're going to go to this school, you're going to go to that school, marry this person or marry that person, get married or not get married, get divorced or not get divorced. And then we go, you know what, just, just follow your heart. 
Church, can I say something? Please don't follow your heart. Stop following your heart. It's desperately sick. It's desperately wicked. That's not who we, that's not what we follow. There's a verse. If we go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. This is familiar for many of us in verse 16. Scripture tells us that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. So right here, Scripture tells us what is true and what is not opinion. The Holy Scriptures, God's Word, Old Testament to New, that God breathed out, and what is it good for? It's profitable for teaching, that's how I learn the truth, for reproof and correction, for when I vary from the truth, and for training in righteousness. This is the opinion that matters, is what the Bible is saying to us. That's God's opinion. And then one more place, in the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 20. It says, Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That should give us great confidence. It's, it's the will of man didn't produce this. I've been in Bible studies where someone will say, well, that was just Peter's opinion, or you know what, that was just Paul's opinion, or, or what did they know 2,000 years ago? What did they know 4,000 years ago? There's a verse. No prophecy was produced by the will of men, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Spirit. That goes right along with the previous passage. All of this is God-breathed. We go all the way back to Jeremiah. If you trust in God, you're blessed. Trust in the opinions of man and our interpretations and our preferences, you're cursed. Why? Because our hearts are desperately wicked. You guys see where I'm going with this? So in this series where we're covering different things that need to be said, this weekend, this is something that needs to be said. And I think it needs to be said over and over and over again. And even if you know it, we need to be reminded of it. We need to say it to one another. Believe it right down to the very marrow of our bones. And that's this. Opinions don't matter. Scripture matters. Do you believe that? When we're talking about God, when we're talking about heaven and hell, when we're talking about salvation, when we're talking about right and wrong, when we're talking about marriage, we're talking about life, we're talking about sexuality, opinions don't matter, scripture matters. What about the future? What about the end? Well, I think it's going to be this. Well, I think it's going to be that. Opinions don't matter, scripture matters. Without it, where do we stand? Without it, where is our foundation? This is a big deal. And it used to be we fought this battle outside the church. Now we're fighting on the campuses of Christian universities. And now we're fighting this battle within the walls of churches. Now make no mistake, I I don't want the tabernacle ever to be a place where anyone isn't welcome. We welcome people that are seeking, that don't know the truth, that want to hear the gospel, that want to be taught God's word. Whether they're Christian or not, they are welcome. But those of us who are saved, who have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, who claim to be followers of Christ the Lord, right? We need to stand firmly together on this truth that needs to be said. Opinions at the end of the day don't really matter. Scripture matters. Scripture matters. What about tradition? Scripture matters. What about what does the Pope say? Scriptures matter. Come on, somebody get excited. What about my favorite TV preacher? His opinion doesn't matter. Scripture matters. I go off the reservation. You show me where I'm wrong, ditch me and dump the body somewhere they can't find it. (laughs) Because we want to be a church where scripture matters and that's what we stand on. That's why God gave us his word. That's why he gave us his word. And that's the only way in this day and age that you can be sure and know that you know that you know what God wants from us and how we should worship 
him, how we respond to him. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit fired up. You're like, man, I came back to church. I got a mask. I'm glad I wore one. He's spitting all over the place. (laughs) It's because this is important. This is important. You know, it says in, uh, in, in, in John chapter 10, Jesus said these words. He said, the scripture, God's word, cannot be broken. It cannot be broken. There's a verse. You can look it up. In John chapter 10, he says, the scripture cannot be broken. Why do I bring that up? Well, because some people, they want to take part of the Bible. We want to take the parts of the Bible that we like and leave out the parts that we don't like. And this is nothing new. This goes all the way back, you know, to the time of Jesus when he talked to the Pharisees. And he was like, you know what? You obey part of the scripture, but you ignore this part. You follow all the rules about tithing, not just your money, but on your spices, but you ignore the laws about generosity and caring for those that have less. You can't break God's word. You can't break it into the parts that you like. Thomas Jefferson tried to do this 200 years ago. Very famously, he took a Bible and he cut out every bit of the miraculous, literally with a pair of scissors. Yeah, one of the fathers of our country, right? And I know they're already blasting him and tearing his statue down, but still, you know, we think, well, Jefferson, whatever, he, was, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, he took a Bible and everywhere there was a miracle, he cut it out. And it was known as the Jefferson Bible. You don't have much of a Bible left, Tommy. The scripture can't be broken. And so in 2020, many of us, we love the parts about Jesus, but when Paul, inspired and carried along by the Holy Spirit, tells us some things we don't quite like, we go, you know what, I'm just gonna read the Gospels. You know what, I'm gonna ignore Genesis. Because I like the loving Jesus, right? The yoga Jesus. The, 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 the rabbi kind Jesus who's wearing a, you know, a dress and Birkenstocks. I don't like the Jesus of the Old Testament. I don't like the Jesus of Revelation that's coming on a white horse with a sword. The scripture cannot be broken. That's why we say from beginning to end, we find all the Old Testament's about Jesus, all the New Testament's about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And your opinion on that doesn't really matter. There's verses that will tell you (laughs) that what you're holding on to is not a tusk. What you're holding on to is not a tail. What you're holding on to is not a fan. Your little opinion that it's a tree trunk, (laughs) oh, it's bigger. It's much bigger than that. It says in Hebrews chapter 4 that God's word is, is uh, living and active. It says, it's, well, the scripture says it's living and active, but in Hebrews it specifically said it's a double-edged sword and that it's able to, to, to separate joint from marrow. And, 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 and essentially what it's saying to us is you don't judge scripture, scripture judges you. Right, so there's some people, usually that are skeptics, that they'll read part of the Bible and they're like, I don't know if I like that. Well, who asked you? (laughs) Right? I don't know if I agree with that. Good luck. (laughs) Did we forget who wrote the Bible? All scriptures God breathed. Ah, but there were men that wrote it. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Why am I even arguing this? Why do I even have a negative opinion about what the Bible says? Because my heart is desperately sick. And that includes preachers. That includes preachers. We want it to say what we want it to say instead of what God has said that it says. You know, it's interesting about the Bible. When you read the Bible, and you know, I'm starting to wonder if that's why many of us don't ever like to be in groups or spend a lot of time reading the Bible. It's not because we're not readers. It's because when you read the Bible, it exposes you. You see the dark places of your heart. You see where you're just like those Old Testament characters or the Bible story characters. You see where you're wrong. No one likes to be wrong. We like to be entitled to our opinion. Just like our first parents back in the garden when the, when the snake said, you will be just like God, right? We want to say, this is my opinion. Well, good for you if it's about genes But if it's about truth, opinions don't matter. Scripture matters. It says in Isaiah chapter 40 that the word of God stands forever. 
The word of God stands forever. Think about that. There's many people that have tried to say, well, you know, God's word is outdated. Uh, Not according to Isaiah 40. It says the word of God stands forever. There's even some Christians that will say, you know what, now science and psychology and psychiatry, psychiatry, we realize that, you know what, in the New Testament, even some of those epistles, they, they didn't know that, now we do know that sometimes people are born a certain way. So whatever they struggle with is not their fault. You can have an opinion, oh, I'm gonna get in trouble. You can have an opinion on how you identify God knows who you are. He knows who I am. And your opinion doesn't really matter. How do you feel inside? Scripture matters. You see the smile on my face? I'm saying this because I love you. I'm not trying to be snarky. If Pastor Tim was here this weekend, he'd be like, John, you were a little snarky. I'm not trying to be snarky. I'm trying to tell the truth. It matters. If ever it matters, it matters now. The word of God stands forever. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, he said, if you abide in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. But you know what comes after that? There's a comma on it. It says, if you are truly my disciple. So it seems to say that not only is this the truth and it's the only thing that really matters at the end of the day, as far as our knowledge and what we know about God and the gospel and Christ and and how we're supposed to respond and what is right and what is wrong, because it stands forever. He's saying that none of that is to be mean, it's to set you free. You see, once you know what the foundation is and once you know that that foundation is solid, wow, now there's freedom. Now you're free to build within those guardrails. You're free to build on that solid rock and you don't have to worry about it giving way. Because if ever was there a time when nobody seems to know the truth, is it not August of 2020? Just about this quarantine thing, I honestly do not know who to believe. And I know you have a theory, don't post me up when the service is over because I read just like you do. I do have access to the internet, yes. Thank you. But how do you know? What's a COVID death? What's not a COVID death? Is it masks? Is it no masks? Does everybody have to get it? Will there be a vaccine? What about the economy? What about the future? I know one thing for certain. I know where I stand. And I know that I've exasperated some of you because you want me to take a stand. This is the only thing that matters anymore to me. Standing for this, living for this, talking about this, sharing this, and if necessary, going to jail and dying for this. That's the only thing that matters. Because all the rest of it, it's just, uh, we'll see. Like sands that go through the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. I have no idea where that came from. (laughs) And I am sober as a judge. (laughs) If you're truly a disciple, God's word sets you free. Because it doesn't change. It can't be broken. It'll expose you. It'll expose you. But we learn not to rely on our heart, and we learn not to rely on our feelings. We learn to stand on the never-changing word of God. We learn to believe the gospel that way. You know, there's some folks now that, even in church, they want to say, well, you know, we have to change the standards for sexuality. No, your opinion really doesn't matter, you know? I, I just heard the news this past week of someone that, uh, my wife and I care deeply about a younger ministry person, and, and, and uh, a friend of a friend said, well, you know, now she believes that it's important for us to start, um, uh, start to relate to God as a woman, you know, because women for so long, and the patriarchy, and the misogyny, and, you know, we need to help women relate to God, and men they also need to relate to God as a woman, and that's a cute opinion, And I don't mean to be mean. I'm not being mean, but I'm going to stand for the truth. In Scripture, God identifies as a father. And last I checked, that was a man. And when God came in flesh 
to rescue us from his wicked or from our wicked hearts, right? He came as a man, the son, and he died on a cross. And that's not sexist. God's telling us something. He's saying your gender matters. The way I made you matters. My truth matters. It stands forever for all times and all places and all peoples. We don't get to break God's word. God's word breaks us. We don't get to conform God's will to our opinion. It conforms us or it'll leave us behind. And that is the gospel truth and it needs to be said. It needs to be said. We need to remind each other of that. So what about you? You personally. Maybe you're a person this weekend, oh, I agree with all of that. That's good. But are you still following your heart? Are you still trusting your opinion? Are you still trusting your perspective? Because it can seep in. Those of us that are older, and I can't believe I'm saying I'm part of the older set, but I've got the old AARP mailer every week since I turned 50. Those of us that are older can judge the younger based on our opinion. Hey, opinion doesn't matter. Scripture matters. We can judge the style based on our opinion. Uh, have we done anything that's not biblical? That's why from the very beginning of this slow burn revival at the tabernacle with every big change, whether it's paint on the wall or music style or ties or no ties or put up a cross or not, we always go, show me. Show me. You show me, we'll change it. You can't show me, nice opinion. Thank you for coming. Get some coffee when we're open for that again. Because ultimately, opinions don't matter. Only scripture matters. Why? Because like I said before, you can think whatever you think, that everyone's blind except you. But I mean, just think of yourself as one of those six blind men trying to grab a hold of a root, or a, is it a tree, is it a snake? What, is it a wall? Let me show you what the truth is. Can we put that picture up there? Yeah. <laughs> That's what it is. That elephant's name is Truth. And he's coming for you. That's some tons of muscle and sinew and truth. <laughs> On my opinion. On my opinion. That's why we don't follow our hearts. That's also why we need to know this book. Do you know this book? Do you know the scriptures? Are you just taking my word for it? See, the tabernacle wants to be a place that's always known to stand on God's word. But that's only as good as it are people, men and women, students, children, who also know God's word. Just show of hands here in Manistee. I, I want to try this in both places. Just play along. If you would rather base your life on scripture rather than opinion, if, if you would agree with me by a show of hands that opinions don't really matter, ultimately only scripture matters. Just between us and God, would you put your hand up if you're like, yep, only scripture matters. Great, keep them up, keep them up. Come on, I know some people are like, I don't like to play this game. I'm gonna make you play, I want you to be awkward. Man, see, I see you, kind of. Hold your hand up a second. Okay, you put your hand down then. If your hand was up, by your own witness, by your own admission, and even if I can't see you, God saw you. That this is what matters, his truth, from old to new to the end, and everything in between that's based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you have said that by your own witness, what will you do about it? Do you know it? No? What are you going to do about it? Could you know it better? What are you going to do about it? Every one of our programs based on the Bible. In fact, this year, working with our leadership from men's fight clubs to women's Bible studies to student ministry to children, if it's not based on the Bible, we're really not interested in it. 
We're going to be a church of men that gather around the Bible and wrestle with it and let it expose us. We're going to be a church where women gather around the Bible and they're exposed by God's truth. We're going to have student ministry. Yeah, there's still going to be walking tacos and pizza and all that goofy stuff, but it's going to be founded on the scripture because opinions don't matter. Well, I want a youth group like this. Well, I want a youth group like that. Go find one. Here, scripture matters. Are you with me? Are you with me? Bow your heads with me then. Lord, thank you that you give us enough of a free will. That we get to have opinions about the things we prefer. The little rocks, if you will. But God, would you help us not to sell out to this everybody's right thinking or everyone's entitled thinking, even in church? Would you help us to base our lives on the unchanging truth inspired by your spirit, embodied by Jesus in the flesh, that that's who we worship, that's who we follow, and it's only his opinion at the end of the day that matters for us. God, would you help us as men and women, students and children, to do what we need to do to base our lives entirely on scripture. Maybe it just starts with just reading the Bible a little bit. God, thank you that it never changes and that you never change, that you are the great God, the great I am who eternally exists in three persons. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for for Jesus who makes your gospel possible to set us free. And it's in his name that we pray.